right. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Summer with the Milwaukee Public Library. I'm Janice, the Children's Librarian, and I work at the Good Hope Branch. Even though we can't be with you in person today, we will continue to read, create, and discover together, all from a safe distance. Our summer programs for children, teens, and adults are free, fun, educational, and online. The Teen Summer Challenge for teens ages 13 to 18 encourages you to take the public art scavenger hunt around the city, earn a point for every piece of public art you discover and visit, mix and match reading with other fun summer activities to get even more points. This event will count. We encourage you to visit mpl.org slash summer reading or your neighborhood library to sign up today. And the program does go through the end of August, so you still have time to sign up. We bring you today's Meet the Author program with Anurata D. Rajukar as part of our virtual teen programming. Just a heads up that the audience members can ask questions of our guests by typing into the Q&A, which can be found in the function panel below. I and fellow teen librarian Dana will be monitoring your questions and we will save some time for Anurata to answer them near the end of the program. We'll also add some great links to chat for you to explore after the program. So without further, Ado, I am going to introduce our fabulous author, Anuradha Rajakar. So Anuradha D. Rajakar is the national recipient of the SCBWI, the Society for Children's Book Writer and Illustrators, Emerging Voices Award for her contemporary debut novel, American Beijing. Born and raised in the Chicago area to South Asian immigrants, Anuradha earned two degrees from Northwestern University and for many years had the joy of being a public school teacher by day and a writer by night. Nowadays, when she's not writing or reading, you can find Anuradha hiking the shores of Lake Michigan with her family, obsessing over her garden, watching old horror flicks with her son, eating too many baked yummies, and my favorite part, roguishly knitting sweaters without their patterns. She hopes her stories will inspire teens to embrace their unique identities and inner badass despite outside pressures and cultural expectations. American Fetia is her first novel. I am a huge fan and a disclaimer, a friend of Annie's for quite a while, and so excited to have her here today. So welcome to Anurata, or as I know her and love her, Annie. So welcome. So I'm so happy to have you here, and I can't thank you enough for being here with us. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. This is like yes. a day amount of time I've spent in the Milwaukee Public Libraries um, over the years, it's really like surreal to be here talking with you and, um, you know, getting to do this event. So I'm, I'm so glad you made the time to do it. So I appreciate that very much. So, all right. So my first question, after we became friends, you mentioned to me that you had been writing a YA novel for quite a while. I think you told me 10 years and I, that was probably seven years ago or something that we met. Um, where and when did the seed and idea of the book begin and how long was the whole process from writing or the kernel of the idea all the way to the publication this past March? Yeah, I, um, I love this question because it's, well, you're right. It was, it was really over 10 years. It was probably about honestly about 15 years and then when I think oh. about just the time that I wanted to from the time I wanted to write it I was around 15 so then you're adding another 15 years onto that and I'm totally dating myself now by telling you how many years I've been working on this one novel <laughs> but honestly um you know it started with when I was a kid really I mean I was a really quiet kid and I read a lot I found myself in stories and I was journaling from the time I was maybe in like second grade and so around that time you know, from second grade, it was like what I had for breakfast, you know, nothing exciting in the journals. But as I got older, I found myself sort of um, doing some experimental stuff in my journals based on what I was reading at the time. And so like, as I got older, I loved whatever YA was available at the time, which was like Judy Bloom. I guess, mm -hmm. I don't know if Catcher in the Rye was really considered YA, but it had that teen voice. Um, Lois Duncan, I really loved. Um, and as I got, got older, I started reading James Baldwin, who's not YA, but I really felt like I found myself, I sort of found my sort of writer's stride um, within those authors' works. And, you know, really it was James Baldwin who reflected most, um, which was really interesting as a gay uh -huh. 
and living in Harlem. <laughs> I mean, I was none of those things, but um, writing, he wrote so much about race and love and trauma. And um, I think that that really inspired me in, in ways I didn't really realize at the time. It was like at ETHS, which is Evanston Township High School, where we both went to high school. Right. Um, I had some English teachers there who were incredible and they, they really encouraged some of the creative writing, um, you know, being from an immigrant family, it's not like I was exactly like encouraged to like follow my bliss and write creatively. My dad, um, when I told him I wanted to be a creative writer, which I think I told him around 16 or 17, he was like, well, what about journalism? You know, which is a reasonable <laughs> suggestion. And I tried that in college, but it really didn't stick. I did learn some really great fundamentals about writing, um, being a journalism writer. I tried it for two years in college, oh. um, but it was like, it was around that, like te those teenage, I guess I would say like maybe 15 or 16, that the idea for the story came to me. And it, you know, it just felt so like ubiquitous that feel that desire for love and belonging um, especially if you feel othered in some way, like what are you going to do for that love and belonging when it does come to you? And so I thought that was a really, that sort of was an idea that wouldn't let me go. And um, so I kind of, it wasn't really until I stayed home, I, I went into teaching and I decided I'm going to write in the summers, which didn't exactly happen because as a teacher, you're expected to do a lot of other stuff over the summers. But so it was when I left teaching and I stayed home to raise my boys that I decided um, they were really close in age. So I decided I'm just going to focus on them and try to write in those stolen moments. And that's what I did. It was like, you know, in the van with my computer while they're at soccer practice and um, late at night, it, you know, if I couldn't sleep or whatever. Um, I read a lot of short stories around that time when they were, I, this was maybe like 2006 or so. Um, I read a lot of Alice Munro, Nell mm -hmm. Fletcher, Jhumpa Lahiri. Um, and that's when I sort of thought, you know what, I think I could probably write a short story. I don't think I could write a whole novel. I didn't really like believe in myself and I wasn't like totally there yet. So I wrote, wrote the short story and it actually is the story of American Betia in a short form. That's amazing. Um, it, yeah, I tended, I happened to meet Lauren Fox in town, who is an incredible author. And yeah. she hadn't even um, published her first book, but she, we, she found out I was writing too. And she just invited me to her writing group, which was super generous and awesome. I was like, don't you want to read my writing before you invite me? To <laughs> <laughs> so, but she was like, no, just come. So um, we did that. And, and the writing group read the short story and suggested that I turn it into a novel. So it was kind of like the permission that I needed and wanted. And so um, over that like 10 year period, I wrote in little bits and, you know, parts and fits and starts. And um, it, I think I ended up finishing that first draft around 2016. So it took, yeah, that long. Uh, I met another woman named Lisa Weimer, who is a YA author in town, and she helped me sort of streamline the story. It was about twice as long as a normal YA novel, which I'm like, why wasn't I paying attention to some of the conventions of the genre? But I, I was just very focused on the story that had been percolating, like sort of like knocking down the door of my heart, you know, for so many years. I felt like this is a story I kind of needed to tell almost just for myself. It was almost like a journal, you know, it was my journal writing in, in a in a book form. Um, so yeah, and then I submitted it to the SCBWI Emerging Voices Award simply because I really I really needed, it was sort of like a pipe dream that it would win an award before it got published, but I thought it might help me, you know, stand out from the crowd when I'm applying or submitting to agents. And I was shocked when they called and said that it won. Um, so that was, and Lakita Wilson won for the middle grade version, but mine won, American Betia won for the YA category. So, so that was really exciting. And then things kind of happened quickly after that. Yeah, that was amazing when you won that. I, that was, what a gift that ended up being. Was, uh, so yeah, yeah, for sure. It was fun to celebrate with you at, during that time. So Yeah, I'm so excited for you. School, being like, oh my gosh, Jana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we initially bonded, I think, and I remember exactly where it was. We were in the copy room at the school. So Annie and I both worked at a school in Charlotte. So that's where we met. But we initially bonded over our shared experience of growing up in Evanston, actually, as it turns out, in the same neighborhood, probably about four or five blocks away from each other. Um, even though we're about a decade apart, but we still had similar experiences. 
Um, and feeling, both of us, I think we talked a lot about feeling very much an other, which is what you mentioned in your answers to your first question. I mean, you being of South Asian parentage and um, immigrant parents, and um, we grew up in a predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood as a Jewish family. So um, that was interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that and how much of the experience that you had went into the character of Ronnie, the main character of the book? Oh yeah, I, I love this question. I mean, it's like, I always think about, I always talk about myself as, oh, I was a shy child. But, and you and I have talked about this before, but looking back, I kind of wondered if it was more of like suffering from a lack of confidence, some of it due to those little kind of microaggressions mm -hmm. othered over the course of a lifetime. So, you know, kids, of course, we all know when they're younger, when we're all younger, we can be cruel. We don't necessarily have the understanding of it, you know, how to be inclusive or what are those small ways that you can cut people down without, you know, how, how impactful and how hurtful that can really be. So I think that that kind of stuff just happens to many of us. I mean, I think most of us, I would say, can really relate to that feeling. Um, and, but when you're younger, you don't really have the language yet, at least, especially back then, you know, there was really no word for microaggression is not something anyone talked about or racism, of course, people knew, but um, it's those small moments that were kind of harder to pinpoint, harder to talk about. Um, and so this story kind of forced me to discern what some of those experiences really that are so common to so many of us growing up different, how it kind of lends itself to sort of always feeling maybe outside looking in, marginalized, um, invisible even, erased. Um, and so Ronnie, you know, she navigates these social spaces at different points in her life. There's some flashbacks in the story to when she's younger. Of course, most of it takes place when she's in high school, but she has some flashbacks from when she's younger. There is a scene where she wears a sari for many of the Halloweens, her parents suggest. Oh, you've got all these beautiful Indian clothes, wear that and be, you know, just wear a sari. And so, but then as she gets older, like third or fourth grade, there's sort of a fateful time where she does wear the sari and there's a lesson in there that kind of help her realize which are her true friends and which are not. And mm -hmm. because of certain, um, I don't want to give too much away, but it's, um, you know, people can be really hurtful when it comes to some of those like cultural traditions or clothing and um, she faced that, which kind of helped her, it kind of created this like building that sort of ironizing herself and building up her guard basically um, when it came to her culture and sort of this feeling of needing to minimize aspects of culture and aspects of that, you know, heritage. So I felt like that I could totally relate to. Um, Evanston Township High School is actually a really diverse community that mm -hmm. itself on its diversity and is a beautiful, wonderful community um, in so many ways. But there is also the sense then that racism can't happen in places yeah. like which I think is um, something that I wanted to explore because of course it can happen in places like that because in the end it comes down to just individual experiences. Yes, a community can be really you know, pro-diversity, but in the end, it, there actually are very few South Asian families there and Asian families in general in that town. And so, especially in the eighties when I was, mm -hmm. it was like, you know, now there's sort of stand up for AAPI and, you know, that really wasn't, that's very recent, you know, that's actually 2021, that that's a sort of more part of our cultural mainstream conversation, but back then it wasn't there at all. And so yeah. I kind of wanted to lean into that a little bit and explore that, what it's like to be part of um, a community where there's a lot of Black families and Hispanic families, um, but not so many Asian families. And so what did Ronnie deal with? It's a lot of like, what, well, what are you? And, you know, that kind of thing that is, again, that question alone is so othering <laughs> when you're trying to just sort of fit in and just, you're like, well, I'm just, I was born here and I'm American and my parents are from India, but, you know, there's a lot of duality and a lot of sort of walking that line. Uh -huh. um, so she, I think what, what I really wanted to do is, you know, she seems so one-dimensionally in some ways too. You know, it's like you bring friends over and your house smells like spices and you're, um, there's incest burn, incest 
um, incense burning and um, the, the silver, you know, icons of the goddesses are set up in the kitchen with the incense and people are like, what's that, you know, and so at that age and stage, you're just so embarrassed in general. And so that's just yet another reason to feel embarrassed and to feel mm -hmm. like you recognize that. So yes, there's a lot in Rani that I could relate to. And oh, there's sure. mother, she's, but she is a very fictionalized character. I actually have a, have trouble writing too close to my personal experiences. It doesn't come out right on the page. So it was fun to make those changes too in her character. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I think we talked about that, that when I was there, I think there, were, there was one family, I think that I remember. And for those that don't know, ETHS is a huge high school. <laughs> There was, I think when I was there, there was over 4,000 kids there. So you'd think there'd be more, but there weren't. And even when I was there, which was a long time ago. So, um, so you brought so much of Evanston alive for me again, in such an unbelievably vibrant way. You even placed one of the scenes across the street from my house, as it turns out, which was amazing to read. Um, so I love books, and we've talked about this, that make place setting a character. Um, it's one of the, my favorite things to read. And you did that very vibrantly. Um, did you have to revisit or refresh your memories for a lot of these places like the high school and the Noise Cultural Arts Center? Or were they still clear in your mind? Because you've been out of Evanston for a long time too. Absolutely. This story, and I so appreciate you saying that because this story was truly a love letter to Evanston. I mean, I very had much. beautiful memories of growing up there. And it's very much a part of my heart. And so... Um, having it being an ode to like, you know, to the city was, it was just a joy. I, and I really worked off of memory for the first draft, for sure. Um, you know, it's such an evocative place. There are these mythical trees, huge, huge old trees everywhere. It's actually called Tree City. Um, and Lake Michigan is so varied each day, as we see here in Milwaukee as well. I mean, it's, it goes from placid to thrashing, you know, within the course of a day. And so it just felt like a really evocative setting for um, a story that is a, kind of a dramatic love story in many ways. So, um, so yeah, it was, the first draft was purely by memory. And then the second draft and the subsequent drafts, I wanted to make sure I was getting it right. You know, especially, you know, touring Evanston Tantra High School. I did that, I went on a tour and that was really cool. I mean, it's actually, a beautiful high school and I don't yeah. really remember it like it just it was a lot more colorful inside you know the different wings are different colors and I don't know that I really remember it that way um and of course they've renovated a lot of the spaces and but some of the spaces are very much like to memory you know there were those I can't remember what it, it's a common area in the hallway where there's fireplaces yes yeah in H Hall yeah, yeah H Hall that's what it was and so yeah. That was still there, and there everything was so bright, uh, bright and shiny, and um, just looked beautiful. Um, it's a really old high school, so some of that architecture was just cool to see. Um, and then, in terms of just, I guess the later drafts, I wanted to just, you know, make sure I had some of those things right. So I went and I took photos. Um, Lighthouse Beach looked a little bit different than I remembered, and um, Har the Harley Clark uh, Mansion. I. Oh, yeah. I that's a really um, beautiful structure that um, is very much a part of the story. And so I just made sure I took photos and, you know, took that back to my computer just to make sure that some of those details were right. Um, and there was actually one scene that takes place at what I remember being the Dempster Street Cafe. I don't know if it was there that oh, one yeah. lived there. It was right by the L on Dempster Street. And I'm okay. trying to remember what the cross street is. Maybe Sherman. Um and it's now Bagel Art Cafe or Bagel huh. or something. And so that- Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. There was a coffee shop. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, it was a coffee shop. And that's yep. one of the climactic scenes takes place around that little spot. And so I was like, should I use the old, you know, the old title? And my editor assured me, it doesn't have to be everything exactly to what it is now. She said, it's, it's okay to have a little bit of fiction mixed up with a little bit of- you know, present day, what the setting looks like today. And so that took some pressure off, like, okay, it doesn't have to be exact. So, but it was really fun to some, do some of that, um, that research. Oh, that's really cool. So um, Ronnie's friendship with Kate, 
um, is one of my favorite aspects of the book. She's such a great character. She's really one of the, I mean, besides Ronnie, she's one of the most vibrant characters. I mean, she's really a very fleshed out, beautiful character. So it's a really empowering friendship. Um, so tell us about Kate and how she evolved as a character and then their relationship as well. Yeah, I mean, Kate's the kind of friend, much to Ronnie's surprise after a lot of sort of disappointments with friendships, who just blends really seamlessly in Ronnie's family She and, and culture of origin. She really respects and admires, you know, Ronnie and her family as, as people first. She's not like, oh, look at this cultural, interesting little thing. Tell me more about this. You know, it's more just like, cool, you watch this, you know, these Bollywood movies, let's do it and let's try the dance numbers together. I mean, she's just very accepting and sort of arms open, you know, to, to the family and to some of their traditions. So that was actually just really fun to write. And it was very much, I feel like based in so many beautiful friendships that I've had over the years, I've had so many friends who were that way. And so that, you know, Kate was somebody who was actually rather easy to write in many ways. Um, it also, there's a lot of humor between them. And so I wanted that in terms of sort of striking a balance in the story. There's a lot of tough topics that are tackled in the story. And so Ronnie and Kate's like sort of open conversations about sex and sexuality and boyfriends and love and feminism are um, just felt really like sparky and light and, ha you know, happy in, in many ways. And so I wanted Ronnie to sort of have Kate as somebody to draw strength from. And, you know, one thing that was kind of fun with Kate is that she sort of is like a little bit of a Greek chorus in the story. Like she is the way that Ronnie can process some of the issues that she finds herself coming up against with Oliver. Mm -hmm. And so she's this like, as a confident, you know, feminism, her approach to love and sex and, um, help to sort of deepen Ronnie's understanding of some of the things that she's facing with her first love. And um, so some of like Kate's beliefs and language felt kind of really current and, um, you know, kind of alive for me. Um, those were some of the easiest scenes to write somehow. Um, I also thought it was important that as a white character, she sort of showed that sort of ready acceptance of Ronnie's culture, you know, Oliver is also a white character. So I wanted to really show that like, just because you are white does not mean that you don't have that like ability to, you know, accept and embrace. I mean, that's ridiculous to think of it that way. So I wanted to sort of show the variety in both of their characterization um, and just show how empowering our friendships can be and like a lifeline in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, the language really was very current. That was, and that's kind of amazing because you had been working on this for so long. Did you have to, I mean, this is not a question that I wrote down, but did you have to like, I think, didn't you say like ran some of it by your sons so that it was like making sure that you weren't, you Absolutely. know, dating at a decade behind or something? Cause you really kept it very much in the moment. Yeah, it was a lot of research, a lot of reading, you know, but a lot of it is, yeah, making sure my sons were, they were pretty instrumental. I mean, there were things that they, they read, you know, some really later versions, like right when it was about to go to print, because I didn't want them reading like early versions that everything's going to be changed around anyway, you know, so I, I kind of waited. And then they wrote, read those later versions and um, sure enough, found a few things, you know, so I was super grateful, you know, where my, my older son was like, I just don't think that, you know, kids my age would use that particular word. It was pretty like specific, That's but good. those words did feel, you know, important to feel confident about that. So that was really good. Um, yeah. So yeah, they were, they were very much a part of that process. In-house editors you have there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, love I was so nervous to have them read it. But they, I'm sure. But it was really good. I'm glad. That's awesome. So did certain themes evolve as you went through the process or did you always intend to explore the themes of racism and ethnicity as well as a cross-cultural relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think I always knew that I wanted to explore cross-cultural relationships. It's just not, you know, I wanted to write one that was like really swoony and sensual about first love, but also one that tackled some of those issues that teens I feel face every day um, that we don't always see handled in the mainstream or talked about necessarily. So 
I don't think I really realized though how complex some of like that those issues of race and love and trauma and immigrant the in, immigrant experience assimilation um, were until I really started you know that process of drafting and it was like this like kind of muck in my mind and I was trying to make sense of it as I went um, which is really one of the reasons it took so long to write it was of course a double length you know <laughs> feature book I guess but it was <laughs> so part of it was just trying to understand trying to parse out what it was I was even trying to say and what those feelings were um, so and I hadn't really read a lot of stories that dealt with multiracial relationships. Um, mm -hmm. And though I feel like as our communities are getting more and more diverse, that's so common to have, you know, for teens to be dating across their, uh, you know, cross-cultural um, relationships were so common. Um, and so that to me felt like, and not to say that it's not being handled out there. I just personally hadn't kind of come across stories um, in YA handling it. And so, yeah, in, interested in that idea of first love and how relationships can also really subtly change from being super functional and beautiful and, you know, swoony and great to feeling maybe not so functional, you know, and what are some of those signs that tell us that things are not, you know, serving us in the same way anymore? I thought that was, I love rom-coms. I love Happily Ever After. And this book is a Happily Ever After in a way, um, but I sometimes feel like those can feel really lonely, those stories if mm -hmm. you're in a relationship that doesn't feel happily ever after, and yet you love the person, you know, it's like, it's very confusing. And so I wanted to, um, you know, make sure that the story was kind of true to that, um, that goal that I had. Um, basically that idea that like interracial romance helps us better understand the role um, of the white gaze, I guess, you know, misogyny that plays into some of our relationships and the racism that can unfold in intimate spaces. We always think of racism happening, you know, in like a hate crime or yeah. racial epithet, you know, tossed at you from a stranger, but it's like a lot of times these things are happening in our interpersonal relationships and how confusing that can be because of course you trust the people in your inner circle, whether they're friendships or, um, you know, romantic relationships. Um, how do you, you know, what do you, how do you make sense of that when it's somebody that you trust and are so close with, if they're, if, if, if things start to, if you feel like race is playing a really negative um, or action, um, you know, thoughts about your race are playing a role that's not positive in your relationships. So those were some of the things I just knew I wanted to tackle. I didn't know how it was going to, but um, that was a goal from early on. Next question really quickly, because, sorry, the train was going by, so I had to mute myself so not everybody could hear this train that's right next to my uh -oh space right here. But <laughs> um, So I was gonna read, uh, it kind of leads more into this question um, that this, there's a scene in the car with Oliver, um, Ronnie's boyfriend, and he asks her to wear a traditional Indian wedding dress. And it's a very uncomfortable scene, I think for the reader, as well as um, you make it very apparent how uncomfortable Ronnie is, but that she's really struggling with what she wants to do for him and what is in her in her voice telling her is not quite right. So it really highlights some of the stuff you touched on, but with themes of cultural appropriation, which is also something that is very much currently spoken about, and fetishization. So for you, what was it like to write this scene, which is a, you know, very kind of squirmish, squeamish, there we go, squirmy and squeamish scene to read about, and for her as well. Absolutely. I mean, this was one of those scenes, though, that oddly was really fluid and easy to write somehow. And I think part of it is that it's later on in the story. By that point in the story, as a writer, I felt like I knew Oliver and Ronnie so well. I understood their trajectories. I understood their goals and like what they wanted and what they feared, um, their flaws. And they were almost behaving of their own volition at that stage. I know that writers say that and it's always like, okay, how does that really happen? But this time it really did feel like, oh, I get it. Like these guys are on their track and they're gonna do, they're gonna make their mistakes. Um, so that was an interesting um, scene to write in that sense. Um, you know, cultural appropriation and fetishization is something I'd spent a lot of years thinking about. Um, it's, 
it's, it's not something that, it's something that I've experienced on some level and so many people I know have experienced it on some level. And so the scene was kind of a culmination of so many of those unnamed feelings. Um, so it's sort of just poured out. And I do feel like cultural appropriation and fetishization are really confusing because at first you feel flattered. You know, if somebody notices you for the ways that you are different, you can't help but feel like, excited that oh wow somebody is noticed this is cool you know someone's appreciating my culture and noticing me for who I am and and so that's what happens with Ronnie and I do feel as though um she doesn't really understand until this scene that cultural fetishization is actually a form of objectification and does this person love me for who I am or Am I sort of serving as a fantasy or am I serving as, you know, sort of that, am I, am I playing into some kind of a narrow view that this person has of what I represent based on, you know, stereotypes and preconceived notions about people of my culture. Um, and it's basically like a spreading of toxic myths, you know, that are, are ultimately harmful. And so, it's like, and we can't really talk about cultural fetishization and, um, you know, without recognizing the fact that there, it's actually really deeply rooted in colon, colonization, and mm -hmm. imperialism, and oppression and violence against Asian women. So I think that that's something that, you know, I was hoping to sort of start, like, spark conversation and dialogue about that fact, because I think that that's where, when people don't really understand the history, then they don't necessarily see that, you know, focusing, being so keenly focused on somebody's cultural heritage, you know, you know, behind closed doors and in intimate spaces, it can just feel objectifying. Mm -hmm. And so, and yet Ronnie feels guilty because at this stage in the, in the game, in the story, Oliver's made it clear that he, you know, his home life is kind of devolving and he really needs a lot from her he wants to be part of her world. He wants to be brought home to her family and they have a forbidden love. I mean, it's a very much a secret and she makes it clear to him, if we date, you have to work really hard at keeping this a secret from my parents. And which I think is actually really common in South Asian families. I think a lot of South Asian families are not always open to their daughters dating, especially in high school. It's an absolute, mm -hmm. and, and Ronnie has made that clear that like, it's all about education. We are here because I'm supposed to be getting a great education and anything like this will kind of, um, you know, distract me from that in their minds. So like, you've got to be on board with this. And he said he was, you know, so then of course, over time, he's, we see that he's not necessarily on, on board. And so she finds herself kind of losing herself and giving herself, giving him things that she would ordinarily not, but it's out of this feeling of guilt. And so I thought that was sort of just a really interesting aspect um, of a relationship to explore and kind of an honest aspect as well. Yeah, you did it really well. I mean, it was a very uncomfortable to a lot of like towards the end when their relationship was kind of, it became kind of uncomfortable to read, but then you also saw more of herself coming sort of back out where she was really kind of discovering so much more of herself, which is really interesting. Um, so Ronnie really struggles with having a foot in two worlds, which I think you were touching on as well. But so she's like too American for her traditional Indian parents, like you're saying, not dating, you know, doing your studies. We're here for you. We sacrificed for you and too Indian for some of her white friends. And it's apparent in the beginning when they call her things like Princess Jasmine. Um, and you beautifully explore this juxtaposition between these two worlds by showing her when she's on the weekends with her Indian friends and even going back to India to visit with you know, family. So how much of this was based in your own experience or those of others around you in your South Asian communities that you would also see? Yeah, it was very much based in my experiences. I mean, I would say like occupying and navigating two worlds is definitely something that um, so many of us experience as teens and even as adults, honestly. I mean, you know, you see so many others around you experiencing these similar kinds of things, um, even though everyone's experience is so unique and sort of nuanced. 
um, there is this coexistence of two identities and that du duality and code switching, you know, can really make life feel so complicated. So yes, she's got those Indian family friends, you know, that she sees out pretty much every weekend with her family. And they sort of are stand-ins for family for her. She doesn't have family in the United States. They all live in India. And so the, while the summers are spent, most of her friends are spending those summers you know, working and hanging out and having fun with each other. She is on a plane going to India, you know, so it's, and she misses out on some of those things. So I, again, she's gaining a lot from that too, from being able to travel and being able to see a different way of life. And of course, having tons and tons of family for an extended period of time and an intense kind of a way to spend time with family in another country for three months straight is impactful um, and positive. But that you know that duality is very much a part of who she is and so yeah I mean I feel like there's also a sense of shame when you are you know different um even though you may love your culture you have like let's say is you know for example with Asian families a lot of times there's overbearing parental figures which is what you know Ronnie faces um and, you know, there's emotional pressures about and really high expectations, whether they be academic expectations or, you know, family expectations. Um, and like I mentioned, like the way your house smells or looks or, you know, the long stretches of time visiting people in India or even on the weekends saying, no, I can't hang out. We have an Indian thing. I remember having to say that to friends. And oh. I remember one friend said, you know, you always have an Indian thing. And she said it with so much, you know, contempt. And I understand she wanted me to come to the party or whatever, you know, but it was like, it was hard to have people understand that, you know, and yeah. that, like, what are you really going to do about it? That was really important also to have those family friends that I saw on the weekends and sort of like, no matter what happened with school friends, it was so nice to have that kind of support and security, knowing yeah. that have these people who are really, truly like act like family on the weekends that we see. So, um, so yeah, there's so much about it that I can relate to with regards to what Ronnie, what Ronnie's life is like. It was almost like you had this like community that really sort of helped you to stay sort of grounded in, yes. you know, yourself and who you are and to feel confident in that. And then you have to, like you're saying, code switch back to the high school and then you know, what your community is there. So I don't know, it's really nice that you had that community to really sort of hold you up. Did you have a Jew, the Jewish community? Was that that for you as well? Yeah, I mean, we didn't have any family either in the Midwest. Right. So, um, but I mean, occasionally we would belong to a synagogue, so we would have that as well. But, yeah. um, but we would always go to New York to visit my mother's family. So that was when we saw that community that, you know, was really what our family and community I mean we did have it yeah but um and I, I like went to classes at the synagogue in high school but they were like culture classes you know I was a Hebrew school dropout <laughs> so. <laughs> um so let's see we have oh, about seven minutes left so I think I'm just going to ask one or two more because I want to have if anybody has questions again I see we do have some attendees you can place them in the um, question and answer panel below, and we can save some time for Annie to answer them if anybody has any, but I don't see any pop up, I don't think yet. So I will double check, but nope, not yet. So I will continue. So I'm gonna go back to the one where I say, I love how Ronnie's voice is so clear and very mature. I mean, the language in it and the themes are a lot more mature than some of the young adult that I've read actually. Um, can you talk about the process of developing her voice? So did she always start off with this voice 25 years ago when you came up with it or whatever? Um, or was there an evolution? I know there was in her keeping her current, but her voice itself. Yeah, no, this was actually a great question because um, what's funny is that there, there definitely was an evolution with regards to her voice. At first, she had a lot of sort of self-esteem issues, which was very close to how I was <laughs> at her age. Um, it was definitely closer to like what I struggled with growing up. I was pretty underconfident and had a lot of just, you know, insecurities. Um, but at some point in the process, I realized that for the storyline, it was important for that she have focus and, and ambition and a sense of self-confidence. Um, that part of her ambitions to become a doctor came from sort of those implicit, part of it from those implicit pressures of her family and community to choose 
you know, a practical and stable career. Um, and but but part of it came also from her personal experiences by being with her aunt in India. I wanted that like deep connection to a specific person in India. And so her aunt was an, a, a doctor in India. And so that shaped helped shape her interest in medicine. And so I felt like that nuance was really important to explore from the standpoint of having a certain baseline level of you know, strength. Um, so that when she realizes how far she's fallen from her true self with her relationship with Oliver, um, it takes, she has to sort of re, um, she has to kind of return to that same, you know, sense of individuality and inner strength um, in light of everything she goes through, uh, despite everything she's going through with Oliver, like she can re-access that, I guess. Um, I also felt like it was important to show that you don't have to choose STEM and art. You don't, you can, you can actually have both in your life. I mean, the people who are doctors in my life, they're all incredibly creative people. And so I feel like there's a little bit of a messaging that we give to teens, which is like either you're artistic or you're STEM, you know, and it's, I don't know. I feel like I was a math intervention teacher, as you know, um, at um, Lake Bluff Elementary, but I've also, also been really interested in artistic endeavors and, you know, knitting and of course gardening and of course writing and reading. And so I, I wanted to make sure that I was able to do that as well with the story. Um, so that did come out you know, through the process of through the many drafts. Um, the earlier versions of Ronnie's voice also contained some kind of irritation with aspects of her culture that didn't end up fitting with the person that she wound up being in the story, you know, as I, as I went along. So I ended up revising to show that Ronnie can, you can love your culture while still being actually really annoyed with some aspects. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, that kind of came through in some of the revisions and edits in later, later versions. So we do have a question, and I saw that it was from also a fellow Evanstonian, my friend Judy. Um, so she said, what was your support system while you were writing? How did you stay inspired over the course of um, the past decade? Yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, this, thank you for that, Judy. It's the support system, I would say, it really came from that writing group that I had, like I, it was just dumb luck for me to, you know, run into Lauren Fox and yeah. invite me into her writing group and, for it to be such a positive um, aspect of my life, really, and of the writing process. So sharing chapter by chapter with that group and having them, you know, sort of cheer me on was huge, you know, because uh -huh. like, I really needed that sense of permission to go for it, do it, you know, turn the short story into a novel. Um, and then in terms of staying inspired, it was really writing was almost like a relief, you know, especially when you're raising kids and you're teaching and you've got a house and a spouse and a, you know you're just there's so much juggling that when you yeah. just in your the, I'm actually I write in a office, a closet office <laughs> sit down in my little office it's like such a relief that I get to you know um, explore these ideas and thoughts that have been with me for so long so the inspiration kind of came more as just a almost like a mental health thing or a um you know, it's cathartic. And so the inspiration, I didn't focus too much on the end product or, of course, I dreamt of it being published one day, but the focus was more on working through these ideas that have sort of, you know, been percolating and almost haunting me for so long. So I think it was more that than anything else. Um, yes, I had some times where I abandoned it. It would be like two months and I wouldn't write a word because wow. I would feel frustrated or or just life was really super busy so I also while I believe in like regular writing I also sometimes feel like as a mom juggling a lot of things that's not always the most realistic and so mm -hmm. it's good to be kind of true you know just kind to yourself in that process and know that there are going to be times where you want to walk away and it's not the end of the world if you stop writing for a few weeks, you know? I mean, it, I, it is true that it takes a lot longer when you do sit down to re remember what you're even doing. You know, like, what is this story even about? What am I even doing? So, so it, you know, ideally you write regularly, but it doesn't have to be daily. I, it's ideal if it is, but if it isn't, you don't like, you know, flat self-flagellate over that if, if you can't do that. So yeah. try to be consistent if you can. Got to give yourself some grace occasionally. Um, so let's see, there is um, a comment from my mother who's attending. 
As you said, I love bringing up our family in Evanston. It's unique and yet diversity. So thank you, she said, for your insights and tribute. And then um, Jocelyn says, I know this novel was just published and congratulations. So are you currently working on another book? Oh, yes. Thanks, Jocelyn, for that. And thank you, Janice's mom, for that. Also. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So my second book that I'm working on, I'm really excited about. It's very different. And it's, it's, so it's really stretching me creatively. And I'm kind of in that phase of like up at 3 a.m., like thinking of like a piece of the puzzle that's so writing it down. So it's a little, so I'm tired in other words, <laughs> but I'm also really like in that mode of just, it's just feels really exciting to start on a new story, you know, after having written American Betia for so long. Um, so yes, the next one, I can't wait to share more about it. You're really not allowed to talk about certain aspects. I'm sure. Of publishing until a certain point. So I wish I could share more, but I will be sharing more about my next book soon. Awesome. Well, I, we have hit our 45 minute mark. Um, so we ran out of time for the last couple, few questions, but um, one of the questions was about the artwork. So if you could just quickly hold it up because our copy is checked out and show the beautiful cover um, of American Betia. So there it is. And I very much encourage everybody, whether you have an Evanston connection or not to read this beautiful book about Ronnie's experience. So I wanna thank you, Honorata, Annie, for coming and spending time with us. This means the world to me that you sat down and spent time with me um, and with our MPL community and doing this for us. Um, and thank you. Yeah, thank you. So humbled and grateful. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. And thanks Ed, to everybody that attended. Um, thank you for our audience for joining us today. And remember that our summer reading programs are going all the way till the end of the month. So you can still stop by at all the Milwaukee Public Library um, branches. And you can register at mpl.org slash summer reading, discover tons of fun challenges to keep you learning all summer long um, and continue to join us on Tuesdays um, at, and through Thursdays at 2 p.m. for more great family programs like this. So um, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Dana, on the other end. And thank you, everybody, for attending. So thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>